Hello and welcome to another episode of SpaceX in the News. I'm your host, Kevin. And today we have much to discuss, starting with Starship and a smorgasbord of interesting facts and factoids. Then we'll debrief this week's Starlink 4 or 5 mission, depending on who's counting. We'll go over Crew Dragon's current state of affairs, some upcoming missions, and then we'll finish with today's honorable mention. So there's quite a range of things to go over with you today, and we'll start with Starship's development in Boca Chica. Earlier in the week, Starship SN1 did some major stacking as SpaceX crews lifted the methane tank and put it upon the upper half of the LOX tank. After doing so, a familiar sight occurred when the lower ring buckled a bit under the weight and a big old dimps revealed itself. Ha <laughs> ha, dimps. But why should you worry about it? Elon's not worried about it. Nothing a persuader hammer can't fix. There's even more action going on in the privacy of those white tents. Elon tweeted out a video of his workers working on SN1's nose cone. Relax, boys. Musk is only tweeting your work to the entire world. No pressure. That comes later. Bazinga. Back on February 11th, Fafiel Adami tagged me in a very useful tweet of a rendering he put together of Starship SN1's current situation. And over the following days, he added to it as the build progressed with helpful pics linking their proper place on the stack. I'll put a link to his Twitter account in the description below so you can take a closer look at him. Keep up the great work, at fail 97 Elon responded with the tweet writing that the hardest problem by far is building the production system of something this big. An echo of what he said in a recent interview with Mars Society founder Robert Zubrin. As far as he's concerned, the primary issue here is not developing the Starship, but developing a production line for Starships. They have something like 300 people employed there now. Uh, in a year, there'll be more like 3,000. Elon also wrote that Starship production and improvements will be much faster than Falcon 9, and that his teams are driving hard for fully reusable orbital flights this year. The first 20-click flight could happen in just a matter of weeks, with a possible follow-up flight to 100 clicks. That's kilometers, or kilometers if you prefer it that way. Either SN3, 4, or 5 will most likely perform the first orbital flight with six Raptor engines on board, and it could happen this year. As Starship iterations come through the Boca Chica assembly line, each one will be better than the last. For example, SN2 will have better fit and weld quality than its predecessor, and later serial numbers will require much less weld length. And. Uh, Elon's goal, as he put it, is to be able to turn these out at a rate of two a week. But as far as shielding is concerned, even though these rockets are made out of stainless steel alloy, Starship will need heat shields for orbital flights. But only on the windward side, or the side that faces the direction of descent. And it will be very light and made from ceramic tile, so long as that hasn't changed behind the scenes. However, the joints of the vehicle, where the flaps meet the main body, may need to resort back to transpiration cooling kind of like your sweaty armpits. Transpirational cooling is an idea that SpaceX nixed a while back for the main part of the heat shield. Elon was asked if those huge windows at the front of the ship will let in too much solar radiation, to which he responded, nay. It's similar to the visors that astronauts wore on the moon, and they were totally fine. The high bay for Starship stacking is almost complete, so I guess it can be confirmed that it won't be used for super heavy. Starship high bay. A big Barry Crane is also on site. Maybe they'll use it to put the methane part of SN1 onto a delivery truck. Or maybe they'll use it to stack the methane tank section onto the lower portion of SN1. We do have two road closures coming up in just a few days. And Elon did say that to transport Starship to the launch site, they'll attach some wheels to the landing legs and tow it there. But that could just be the plan for future launches. We shall see. I've gone over this before, but Lab Padre could lose their streaming location on Maria Pointer's property by the end of March, since that is the deadline that SpaceX gave to the locals to turn over their homes. But Lewis has been on top of it, thinking ahead, while searching for a new place to set up these last couple months. We speak over the phone from time to time, and at one point he was looking to set up a new camera site through the local wildlife refuge, but ultimately got access to a small, privately owned parcel along Highway 4. It's close to the launch site, but further from the shipyard. Again, I want to take a quick second to thank him and any supporters of his that have donated to his channel because it costs money to install this equipment and continuously operate it. So if you enjoy keeping an eye on Starship development, please show your support by visiting the Lab Padre YouTube channel and making a donation. All right, last bit of Starship news for today. A couple weeks ago, we spoke about SpaceX's move back to the port of LA, but haven't heard much since. 
Well, the LA Board of Harbor Commissioners have voted to approve the permit for SpaceX's lease, the same land, Berth 240, from before. But now the deal still needs to be approved by the city council, probably next week. According to regulatory documents, SpaceX wants to refurbish currently existing warehouses on the site to build Starship steel rings, stack them together, integrate plumbing and flight-related hardware, also build fins, legs, and the sort, and then ship them off to be fully put together in Boca. Okay, let's move on now and debrief this week's fifth Starlink launch, Starlink 4. On Monday morning, the Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida, carrying another batch of 60 Starlink satellites. Those sats were successfully released shortly after the second stage entered into orbit, which is the important thing, right? So keep that in mind as we continue on. The booster did fail to land on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, which would have been the booster's fourth successful landing and SpaceX's 50th overall. Instead, the booster made a splashdown next to the ship, and it hasn't been seen since. Both Of Course I Still Love You and Recovery Ship Go Quest came back empty-handed. However, Miss Tree and Miss Chief did not, both coming back, unfortunately, with broken fairing halves. SpaceX and Elon still have not given us an official statement concerning the booster's failed landing, which admittedly is unusual for them. The last time something like this happened was during CRS-16, when the grid fin hydraulics locked up and caused the booster to spiral out of control. Yet, instead of attempting to make a hard landing on one of the landing pads on the Florida coast, it performed a soft splashdown, as it's designed to do when something goes wrong. Moving on, we also have some crew dragon news to go over today. The capsule that will take astronauts to space in a couple months for Demo 2 has arrived in Florida and completed its acoustic testing. And yes, NASA has publicly admitted, however brief it may have been, that SpaceX will be the first private company to launch American astronauts since the shuttle in 2011. <laughs> Although they did quickly pull that tweet soon after posting it. Maybe they upset Boeing, I don't know. SpaceX also announced alongside Space Adventures that they reached an agreement to launch private citizens to space aboard Dragon. The space tourism company has arranged seven private trips to the ISS since 2001, but this time, four passengers traveling on Dragon will take a five-day orbital trip at a greater altitude than the space station, which orbits at 400 clicks up. It's expected to happen by next year sometime, but it won't be a possibility for most of us tuning in here. The cost per ticket will be in the millions. But enough of that, let's talk short-term launches that we can all look forward to. SMC shared some pretty gnarly footage of a static fire test that occurred last week in McGregor, Texas. SpaceX is prepping for the GPS-3 flight with the US Air Force that is scheduled to launch on April 29th. But before we even get to that, let's take a quick look at the launch itinerary for March. We have CRS-20, a resupply mission to the space station on the 2nd, followed by Starlink 5, or 6, again, depending on who's counting, with maybe another one following up after that. And then finally, a satellite launch to finish the month out. It's gonna be both super busy and super fun. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. We haven't done one of these on Blue Origin in a while, so let's do one. Blue Origin is still hard at work constructing their new vehicle assembly building at the Cape. This photo was taken by Greg Scott in November, so it's even further along now. And last month, they opened up their new headquarters and R&D facility in Kent, Washington. CEO Bob Smith said that Blue Origin's workforce grew by a third in 2019, and that 2020 is going to be even more remarkable. Well, it sure is looking that way. For starters, the company also just opened an engine factory in none other than Huntsville, Alabama, known as Rocket City. The world-class engine manufacturing facility will produce BE-4 and BE-3U engines at high rate for their new Glenn and New Shepard rockets, respectively. ULA is also going to be using the BE-4 engine for their Vulcan rocket. Blue Origin also plans to send people up to space on New Shepard by the end of 2020, but they estimate that it will take another three, perhaps four more uncrewed flights before they get to that point. Also this year, New Glenn's future launch pad, Pad 36, will be, quote, mostly done, says Blue Origin. But the first launch of this orbital rocket isn't expected to happen until late next year. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. For those of you that support me through Patreon or a YouTube membership, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot to me. You all have a great weekend, and until the next one, Godspeed. Godspeed.